welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, one and all, to this weird cross between Magical Girls and Slice of Life. It's not weird because these two genres are combined, oh, no, 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 no. In fact, that's actually quite commonly done. What's weird is how the two are combined. Now, I realize that that little bit there was not much of a lead-in, but rather than do my general thing of have like this full paragraph of something out of context relating to the show that I am talking about, I figured that today, in this case, that we would jump right in. So, ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection today! Yuki Yuna is a hero. Let's jam. Let's start with one side. Yuki Yuna is a magical girl series. Yuki and her four friends are part of their middle school hero club, which strives for the betterment of the world by doing random odd jobs, from entertaining children to finding a home for a poor lost cat. What some of the hero club members don't know is that the leader of the club, Fu, skillfully acquired them because of some kind of government agency which selected them to be actual heroes chosen to protect the world tree from evil geometric shapes that want to kill the tree and potentially plunge the world into darkness. The girls are given cell phones with a hero app on them, which, when the time arises, allows them to transform into their magical girl forms and move into a pseudo-spiritual world that overlaps with the real world where all the fighting can take place safely away from civilians. How very Shakugan no Shana of them. They fight the beings down until they are weak and either outright destroy them or seal them away so that they can cause no harm to anyone or anything. And the girls are then transported back home safely with absolutely no harm or repercussions placed on them. Ah, uh, this of course is an absolute lie. It's become the popular thing to do over the past couple of years to stray away from what once used to be the standard pillars of the magical genre and instead pepper in some sadness, some tragedy, emotional heartache to add in, you know, some quote unquote realism. In Yuki Yuna's case, the tragedy is not an endless cycle of death and rebirth as some other shows might do, but rather the actual cost of obtaining superior godlike powers. Sure, it is necessary to have these girls come in and fight evil, but no being in the universe can simply go, there you go, they're superpowers, without some semblance of consequence. Of course, this also has been touched on before in other shows of the genre. But the question does remain is what these specific girls in this specific show will have to give up in order to save the world? However, Yuki Yuna does not exclusively spend all of its time on this tragic plot and these tragic themes, instead allowing the audience to experience its characters in a slice of life setting. Its initial few episodes set up the Magical Girl plotline, but then a very large chunk of its middle bit is dedicated to this slice of life. And this slice of life is mostly okay. However, I do find it to be detrimental to the actual growth and development of these characters. If you look at these lighthearted episodes on their own, most of the characters are one-dimensional. Yuki is a happy-go-lucky, bubbly protagonist. Fu is the slightly more responsible leader type. Itsuki is the quiet, reserved little sister. Togo, the level-headed intellectual. And Karin, the Sundere, which is a weird trait for her to so adamantly stick to, considering that most Sundere's that I know don't go full soon with their close friends, but whatever. It's not until the serious elements kick in again and become heavily relevant that the characters are allowed to grow at all. Not all of them grow, granted. I personally didn't feel like Itsuki did much to her own personal story and was just more of a major part of Fu's development, but the rest of the cast grew in very unexpected ways. Karin's Sundari baseline went into overdrive with worries about not actually being useful to the group at all, leading her to become overly reckless and self-destructive. Fu, despite being in middle school, like the rest of them, is forced to become a surrogate mother figure to her little sister, and blames herself for all the rather depressing and tragic things that happened to her and her friends, and most importantly, said little sister. And Togo's analytical mind almost makes a kind of 
Asimov logic loop, where she starts to feel that the destruction of the world is the only way to save it. Yuki herself is kind of the character that changes the least, although you can argue that Itsuki is similar. Yuki never has a decisive moment of change. She doesn't come to any realizations or moments of clarity that force her to change her attitude or personality at all. If anything, Yuki is just a solid anchor for the rest of the cast. She is an unmoving, completely stereotypical hero who wants nothing more than to just live happily with her friends, though willing to completely give up her own happiness for theirs. It's cliche, but I suppose it works. And now for a bit more of a personal and completely subjective complaint, which is that Yuki Yuna does not tell the full story. And I don't mean that in the standard way of like this show has a read the manga ending and you need to go and read the original material to actually get what goes on beyond this. Though that is also true. No, what actually bothers me is that this show was released in tandem with a prequel light novel series. Titled Washiro Sumi is a Hero, it chronicles the events of the previous group of heroes. And as such, it contains bonus information to help flesh out what is actually going on within the show by explaining and showing similar situations that happened previously. Yes, technically you could just read the whole thing after the fact and it almost works the same way, but the way that the narrative beats in that particular prequel actually work, it's almost pretty much meant to be read alongside the show. Unfortunately, if you live in the West, like I do, this is not possible because that prequel light novel is not legally available anywhere. As such, there may be things that I explain from here on out that are in fact explained in Washiro Sumi, but as usual, I'm sticking to my stance that if it is not in the show, I cannot count it. This goes for whatever may come after the show as well. It's one of those things that if you're expecting me to go and read the original material, I might as well have just done that anyway and not wasted my time watching the show. I am watching the show, I am trying to enjoy the show, and that should be it. it. Just isn't always. Now, back to the show. One of the major issues that I have is not necessarily with the, the characters or their motivations, but kind of the world that they live in, specifically involving the god that they are trying to protect. A lot of the god-related things are either left heavily open for interpretation or just seem rather gimmicky. Like, they transform thanks to apps on their cell phones? Really? Like, I realize most modern superhero type shows in Japan can be traced back to Super Sentai and transforming with cell phones is totally something that Sentai would do. In fact, they actually did do. Thank you, Sentai Gal Ranger. But how long has this society actually existed? What did they use before phones, or has it just always been this way? Because magic. There can be levels of hand-waving that I am willing to accept. And on this front, I am only tolerating it because they never tried to explain it away. Because of that, you can just kind of make your own headcanon so that it actually fits together better in your mind, even if it's not an official explanation. But it's when they actually try to give official explanations to things that even afterwards still make no sense. That's when I start having problems. For example, there is a level of cruelty that happens to these characters that makes no sense. Spoilers, by the way. In exchange for their super awesome powers, they lose various functions of their bodies. That's not even the cruel part, because all that is is just equivalent exchange. Because, you know, you can't gain superpowers without some kind of consequence. But in Yuki Yuna, all of that is negated by the ending. Everything that they lost is restored to them, even though it's made quite obvious that fighting in this universe may still occur. So in that case, if their bodies could be restored to them from the get-go, why wasn't that done in the first place. Obviously, it wasn't a kind of remuneration for their powers, otherwise they never would have gotten them back. And at the end, we have these characters who have basically become gods and defeated their enemies and have given up nothing for that ability, despite spending so much time of this show making us think that they would have to. Now, I wasn't hoping for a grim, dark, depressing ending. I was not cheering for these characters to end up permanently disabled by the end of the show because that would just be cruel of me. I was only looking for some semblance of consistency with how this world works. Ah, but it's all run by magic, so who cares? I do. When you set forth rules in your universes, you either stick to them or you give me a damn good reason as to why these rules should be broken. As it stands, it just seems like the god of this world, the one that they have been trying to protect, has been taking away their bodily functions as just some kind of sick joke. It wasn't necessary, and he, she, 
it only gave them back when they rebelled and tried to kill their god as a result. So it just kind of stood back and was like, oh shit, uh, you're trying to kill me. How about, how about I just give all this back to you? It's not like I needed it anyway. This kind of thing infuriates me. It spends all this time getting us emotionally invested, giving us reasons to be upset over the fates of these characters, and then snap all better. It's nice that they got a happy ending and all, but I wish it didn't happen in this lazy deus ex machina kind of way. Now, I am aware that the story continues after this point, and I have been told that more consequences are actually added in later on. But as I stated before, it's not in the show, so I don't count it. The animation fills the requirements of what you would expect from a slice of life series most days, and it can transition into decent animation for the magical girl parts. Most of the enemies in the show called vertexes are all done with CG animation, and it honestly didn't feel out of place. Unlike my complaints with CGI in other series, like Mori Bito last week, the vertexes are done wholly in CGI, and there are supposed to be this kind of otherworldly being, so the CGI kind of makes a lot of sense. It helps by giving them that kind of artificial movement to them. It gives them that feeling that they're not really right. They're not natural, and that works. Besides that, of course, the colors of the characters deserve particular note. And that's because 90% of the time, I really like the colors. Colors help to identify characters, keep everything super light, and definitely add a, a bit of levity to those episodes that are a bit darker and, you know, completely up the scale of the Slice of Life episodes to HOLY CRAP WE ARE SO CUTE! because, you know, that's what it's supposed to do. However, there is still that 10%, and it all revolves around the color choices for Yuki and Karin. In magical girl form, Yuki is solid pink, and Karin is bright red, and during these scenes, there is enough difference to tell them apart. However, it gets confusing when they drop out of magical girl form, because Yuki's hair goes from bright pink to a darker red, making you almost have to do a double take to make sure you realize that you're not actually looking at Karin. It's one of the first times I've seen a show not closely follow the traditional design choice of every hero gets their own color and only their own color, and that is all they have. And it bothered me a lot, especially in the few scenes where Yuki is still in her school uniform and she interacts with Karin, who is in magical girl form. The music is good, but I kept getting that feeling that the composer was either mandated to copy or just heavily listen to Yuki Kajiura's music before composing anything for the show. Why? Because it sounds like Kajiura wrote it. Like, like that in itself doesn't, doesn't make the music bad, but it just perplexes me because of another major point I have, which is this. I just spent more or less this entire video trying not to mention Madoka Magica, which is very hard to do when so many parts of this series are trying to be like it. It's like a little sister trying to live up to the legacy of its older sibling, but it ends up copying far too much of what their older sibling did to be able to differentiate between the two of them. The entire main cast is almost a direct parallel. The foreshadowing and eventual reveal of this tragic deconstructing element follows the exact same beats. And as I mentioned, the whole music sounds like it was composed by Yuki Kadra, which changes and makes identical the entire feeling and tone of the show, at least in the magical girl elements so much so that it's a little too on the nose. To its credit, I do appreciate the slice of life aspect to the series, and that part, at least, was a little unique. I also appreciate that it did try, or at least I felt that it tried, to not just be a pure deconstruction in the same way that Madoka was. To me, I personally believe that Yuki Yuna is more of an attempt at a reconstruction, rather than just a pure deconstruction. It starts off and heads down the path of a deconstruction, similar to Madoka, but then near the end does its best to pull everything back, to remind itself what a Magical Girl series used to be back in the day, and tries to reapply that to its existing world. Pulls everything back and it's like, you know what we used to be about? Power of friendship. That's what we're gonna have. That's what we're gonna do. The power of friendship. Now, I said it's an attempt because I don't feel like it was very well executed. It had the time to focus on it, but it spent far too much time on the slice of life, and the ending felt far too rushed for what it was trying to accomplish. It doesn't invalidate it as a decent series to watch, and I will recommend that you do just that, but it just depresses me because I can see 
how the show could have done things differently, and it just didn't do it. With all that in mind, I present Yuki Yuna as a hero with a recommendation to stream it rather than buy. On its own, the series had me hemming and hawing between stream and buy, but considering how hard it is to actually buy, I'm gonna go with stream on this one. It's not difficult to find, but rather extremely expensive. In North America, Yuki Yuna is available only from Pony Canyon in three separate collector's edition sets, each costing at about $70 US, which is quite out of the price range of most anime buyers that I know. Now, if you really like the series and think that the collector's sets are worth it, that is totally up to you. They do contain some nice artwork, as well as some character songs, a soundtrack remixes on a CD, which is nice, but a bit much if all you want to do is watch the show. Which you can do over on Crunchyroll, if you happen to have access to it. A partial review copy for this video was lovingly provided by the folks over at RightStuffAnime.com, a fine purveyor of anime DVDs, Blu-rays, and other such merchandise for you to enjoy. You can pick up Yuki Yuna from them, among many others, because if it's in print, they have it. Alternate anime recommendations for this series are as follows. For a series with a serious-ish plot, but likes to spend time elsewhere, first recommendation goes to Angel Beats which marks the first time that I've actually mentioned that one as a recommendation. Huh. Second recommendation goes to, well, the obvious Madoka Magica. No surprise there, but if you haven't gotten around to seeing it, seriously, what rock are you living under? This is your reminder to get on that. And between those two, you should find something to your liking. And that's it for me. Special thanks to this month's patrons, Samuel from Belia, Grace Anderson, Nikolai Gray, Lulika Adachi, Joshua Garcia, Victor Ekmark, and Matt G7. You guys are all especially amazing, and I thank you. And until next time, ladies, and gentlemen, and others, stay frosty. Now, I am aware that the story continues after this point, and I have been told that more consequences are actually added in later on. But as I stated before, it's not in the show, so I don't count it. I don't know why I just added music to this, even though it's not music. I don't know what I'm doing, even. <clears throat> I'm sick. Leave me alone. <coughs> <coughs> uh, I'm good.